We are in the fourth week of the study based out of these two verses in Exodus 34 where God actually says to Moses, he tells Moses what he, God Almighty, is like. The context, we're going to get to the, the next phrase that he uses, but it's interesting, the context of him saying this thing, these things that we read earlier in the passage is that Moses actually received the Ten Commandments and he broke them. How... What was he doing? How, how did that happen? You'd think if you, had, if you had God's Ten Commandments that you would carry them like a dozen eggs, right? I mean, and yet Moses broke them. God in his grace, because he is a gracious God, re gave, you know, it's kind of like gave another copy, you know, copy and paste. I don't know how he did that, but he wrote, he wrote it uh, on those stone tablets. But Moses broke it. We're going to get into that and why those two stone tablets were broken by Moses. Not just broken, he smashed them. All right, we're going to get to that. It's important today. But I want to give you just some truth and review in case you haven't been here. Just where have we been as we've been looking at this passage? Uh, let's, read the, let's read the passage first. In verse 6, Exodus 34, 6, the Lord passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Next slide, thanks. There it is. Maintaining love to, a thou to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is God and who he says he is. Uh, we talked, we've talked about Yahweh, right? He is the Lord, the Lord. Yahweh, Yahweh. He is the ever-present I am God. And for his glory and for our good, we can know him and live for him. His name is glorious. He is present. He is here. He is everywhere. The psalmist wrote, where could I go and flee your presence, right? Where can I escape from? You're everywhere. If I go down to the depths, you're there. If I go to the greatest heights, you're there. You're everywhere. This is Yahweh. We talked about him being compassionate or merciful. He is merciful and he is gracious. God is emotional when it comes to us, meaning merciful. He feels great emotion for us, like a mother loving a child. There is this emotion that God, he, is, he feels deeply for us. He cares for us. And he is for us. The grace of God is God helping us do what we could not do otherwise, and he is gracious towards us. He is for us. Our ultimate good is, that, is his desire, and that's expressed ultimately at the cross of Jesus, isn't it? Where Jesus laid down his life, not for his good, but for our good. He is for us. And then last week, we talked about the phrase where he told, tells Moses that he's a God who is slow to anger. And we talked about how, you know, there's thinking, you know, sometimes we think this way, either God is always angry or he is always tolerant. And really the answer is neither. He is slow to anger, uh, but he can get there. He's not always angry at all, but he's slow to anger. We looked at Jesus' teaching about the prodigal son and specifically the father in the prodigal son who was so disgraced, so insulted by his own son, and yet... <laughs> There's no hint of anger, just mercy and grace and compassion for this boy when he returns. My son who is dead is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. And when we, we turn to the Lord in that way, there's no sin that's so great that he won't forgive. None of us have gone too far. God is slow to anger. He is quick to love, quick to forgive, and repentance is the way, right? We talked about how we're offered the option of repenting of those things that are not of him and receiving mercy and grace and compassion from him. So this is what we've been, we've been talking about. And, and to remember this great God who is not like us, right? Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts and neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So in each of these things, you know, sometimes we are merciful and we're compassionate and we're great, but God is like other when it comes to these things. And so today, we're going to talk about the next phrase, which is just he is abounding in love. You know, God loves you can become trite, 
God loves you, God loves you, but God is abounding in love and his love is not like our love. We're gonna see that today. We're gonna see how significant the love of God is and how significant it can change a human heart. So why did Moses break the Ten Commandments? Why, why did he smash them? You know, if we read, you have to go back just a couple chapters. This is actually the context of our, you know, Exodus 34 passage. If you go back into Exodus 32, and actually the very last verse of Exodus 31, just to say, you know, after... Uh, Uh, When the Lord, it says, finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets. So these tablets were from God. These two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Now imagine that. You have two stone tablets of the covenant law. The covenant meaning this is how human beings can relate to God. And they were inscribed by God himself. Moses didn't write them down as God told them to him. God wrote them down. Now, if you're carrying two stone tablets straight from God, wouldn't you take care of those? God in his grace wrote another set. But why did they get broken to begin with? The reason they did is because chapter 32 happened. In Exodus 32, of course, Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, receiving this covenant law. And we'll read a little bit here. It says, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered Aaron around and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Exodus 32 happens. Moses was a long time. Where is this guy? I don't know. Aaron, make us, make us, uh, make us an idol that, for us to worship. And Aaron did. Aaron did. Maybe um, you might be thinking, you know, it was so early on. Maybe, maybe they just didn't know not to do that, right? It certainly was very consistent with what they had grown up observing, right, in Egypt as slaves in Egypt. They saw idol worship all the time. Maybe they just didn't know any better. Well, they didn't know any better, but maybe they didn't know not to do that. Well, they knew not to do that. If if we go back to Exodus 20, uh, if if you ever want to see what is on the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20 is a place where you can read the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words, Exodus 20, verse 1. "I I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That's commandment number one. Commandment number two, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or in the waters, in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations for those who love me and keep my commandments." You know, what's interesting to me is in the Ten Commandments, most of the Ten Commandments are one-liners. You shall have no other God before me, right? You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal, right? You shall not uh, bear false witness. All these one-liners, but for two of them, one is uh, the fourth commandment, the Sabbath day. Keep the Sabbath, keep it holy. And this one... The second commandment, you shall make no image in my likeness. 
These have like paragraphs, like, like so many words describing this commandment. So the people hearing it, they, they should know we're not going to worship any God other than Yahweh, and we're not going to make an image of him. Why was that important to God, that he would make it one of the Ten Commandments and describe it and even talk about people that hate me? You know, I, 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 this, this is important. Why would he do that? Well, God Almighty is spirit, right? He's the one who created the heavens and the earth with his very word. He is spirit and no physical thing, whether it's in the universe and up in space, the sun, moon, and stars, or whether it's on the earth, any kind of animal, or in the sea, no, no created thing can aptly capture the essence of Yahweh. And so he says, don't try, don't do that. God is zealous for his glory, and what happens is when you set up an idol, you get become fixated on that thing and not rightfully on him. He is spirit. He is so unique that he is to be worshipped in unique and distinct ways, not like the rest of the, of the nations. And you know what Exodus 32 was like? Exodus 32 was exactly how all the nations, all the pagan nations who did not know God, it's how they worshipped. It's how they worshiped in Egypt. And the whole 10 plagues and all the whole story of Exodus is God saying, uh, each of your gods, all of your gods, they, they are uh, mute, they, are, uh, they have no, no value, there's no strength in them compared to me. There is no God like Yahweh. So don't even try to make an idol. He's unique. God's chosen people would be different and so when Moses doesn't show up for a while, then people get a little antsy, apparently, and they violate this covenant. And, they, and Aaron, you know, of course, he, Aaron explains later to Moses, oh, there was so much pressure in the moment, but you almost get the feeling like Aaron's like, I don't know either, let's do this. Yep, let's do this thing. And so in verse 7 and following, God says to Moses, because he's still on Sinai, you know, you're going to go down. Your people, they've, they've worsh they're worshiping a calf. These are a stiff-necked people. Let me, I'm going to destroy them, Moses. And I'll start, I'll, I'll fulfill all the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will fulfill everything I intend to do. I will do it through you, Moses. But th these people violating the second commandment, making a golden calf, worshiping it, eating and drinking, raising, you know, rising up to party. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to annihilate them. In verse 11 and following, Moses says, kind of says, no, you know, don't do that. You know, what will Egypt think? You know, you brought this people out with great power just to destroy them in the wilderness. I mean, don't do that. And in verse 14, it says, the Lord relented. The Lord relented and did not bring on the people the disaster he had threatened. So it's like, all right, God's committed. Even in the midst of their sin, God does not give them what they deserve. He relents. He is gracious. That's where the whole passage, right, the whole passage that we're studying comes in the context of that. Moses was experienced that. But now, <laughs> verse, before we get to that, verse 15, Moses then says, oh, good, okay. The people are not going to be, you know, the wrath isn't going to come against the people. He walks down. Uh, Joshua is with him. They hear music, right? What's going on down there? Verse 15 uh, says, Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two stone tablets of the covenant law in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Jo Joshua, you know, there's noise. There's, boy, it's singing. Verse 19, when Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And then he goes on, he burns up the calf, you know, puts it in the water, has them all drink. People died because God relented, but the, mat, the wrath of Moses had come. And in his anger, Moses wasn't slow to anger. 
God's slow to anger. Moses wasn't slow to anger. I mean, people died because of the wrath of Moses in Exodus 32. He brought it. And part of the calamity was the stone tablets smashed there on the mountain. It's in this context that God, in chapter 34, would say to Moses, okay, here's two more tablets. Moses, I'm not going to go without you. And then God comes before him, and then he gives him the description of what he is like. The Lord, the Lord, right? The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. This is the context, right? Exodus 32 and the sin of God's people after he had done such amazing things and his wrath was going to come. He relented. This is who he is. In the midst of such sin and depravity and things that are just unlike our holy God, he says to Moses, but this, is, this is who I am. And Moses experienced this. Moses had wrath. He saw the, the tenderness, the compassion and grace of God. God really is slow to anger. God relented. I didn't relent. He relented. He relented. So we want to talk today about, you know, well, what's next? This abounding in love, right? Because he's slow to anger, but he is abounding in love. And this word, you know, the, the Hebrew word is hesed. Hesed. <laughs> Uh, you got to get your, yeah. Uh, this idea of covenantal love where God loves the people of his people, the people of the covenant. And in the list in, in six and seven, it's interesting because of all those words that he's used, this word is actually used twice in, in Exodus 34. He uses it twice. Whenever you see things twice, you got to say, this is important, Right? Uh, He is abounding in love, and then in verse 7, a phrase later, maintaining love, the same word, maintaining this covenantal love. He's maintaining love to thousands and forgiving the wickedness, rebellion, and sin. They had been wicked and rebellious and sinful, and God abounds in love because these were his people, the ones he was bringing out of Egypt. He loves them. There's this covenantal love. It's another way of thinking about it. It's it's a love that is loyal. Like God has this loyal love, an unfailing love. It is kindness. It is goodness. And it's always related to his covenant, meaning God has decided to you know, uh, relate and be in relation with people under the covenant, and, and here's who I am, and if you obey my covenant, we can be in this relationship. And when there is this relationship because of covenant, God is committed to it. And his love for those are unfailing. It's an, it's an unchanging commitment from God. So covenantal love is more than just action. It's beyond action. It's beyond promise. It's even beyond making an oath. It's this deep, unchanging commitment and care for those in the covenant. He will maintain love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. See, under God's covenantal love, there is no wondering if God loves you because he's committed to it. It is unchanging. And we see that in Israel's story, chapter 32. In spite of their wickedness, rebellion, and sin, God loved them because of the covenant because of the promise he made, because of what he intended to do, and because, as we'll see, who he is. With the coming of Jesus and the good news, one thing we learn for sure is that this kind of covenantal love is not a strain upon God. It's not a problem for God. It's not, you know, this is where we're different. Because if somebody sins against you, Let me rephrase that. When someone has sinned against you, how quickly ready are you to love, to forgive wickedness, rebellion, and sin? Oh, no. (laughs) No, no, no. There's wickedness, rebellion, and sin against me. There'll be conversation, right? There'll be some hide to have. 
There'll be some skin in the game. There'll be some repentance. You, you, wickedness, rebellion, and sin, we're going to talk. God's available. He offers repentance like we've talked about. But it's not a strain on him to love like it often is for us. It's not, a, it's not a problem. It's not a difficulty at all. Why is that? We learn in uh, 1 John 4, 7 and 8, classic text. The Apostle John writes, he says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not, know, who, whoever does not love does not know God. Why? Because God Say it with me. God is love. You see, love is not something God does. Love is something he is. He is love. With God, it's not an action, although there's plenty of actions demonstrating his love. With God, this covenantal love is him. He is love. His unfailing, his love is unfailing because he is unfailing. This is important. I want you to catch this. God's love for you is unfailing because he is unfailing. And if in any way, shape, or form he would be uh, like, stop loving you, it would, it would be, it would, I mean, it would be <laughs> devastating for you, but he cannot, he will not stop this kind of love for you because to fail in his love for you and me would be failing in himself and who he is. And God's God, he's not gonna fail in that way. He, he is who he is. He's consistent with his character. He is love. Love is not something he does as much as it is who he is. And his love is unfailing, for he is unfailing. What does this mean? It means there is no sin that he is unable or unwilling to forgive. You think you've gone too far. You think there's no way. There's a way through God's great love. It would be a betrayal of more than just his promise of love to you or his loyalty. It would be a betrayal of who he is. He's not going to fail. He's not going to be untrue to who he is. So you and I, right, we can know a God who is unfailing love. What does it mean? What does it mean to be in relationship and to know a God who is unfailing love? And I have three ideas for you. Two of them we want you to do. One of them don't do not do, okay? Two, two let's do. One, let's not do. What, what does it mean to know a God who is unfailing love? Well, one, do this. You can build your life on him and his love. Your whole life, your whole system of thinking, your whole way of, of walking through this world can be grounded on the love of God, based in who he is and his great love for you. Do that. Do that. Jesus, you know, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the, what he was teaching, these words, was this foundation. It's the difference between building your house on the sand or building your house on the rock. And the storms of life comes for all of us, but the one who builds their foundation on God, on the love of God, will stand firm through all the storms that life brings our way. You can build your life on God. He is that firm foundation. That's what it means to know a God who is unfailing love. What it also means is that you can take God for granted. God is so unfailing in his covenantal love for you and me that you can take him for granted. Let's not do that, right? Let's not be that guy, not that person. It's not even something that we intentionally choose. We just kind of take God for granted. The people that we take for granted, part of it is we're not really thinking about taking them for granted because we're taking them for granted. You can do the same with God. You can know who you are in Christ, know your future is uh, on a firm foundation, and you can just take him for granted. That's why, you know, following Jesus and even having this rhythm of life, you know, where you gather together with others, at least one hour a week, we're going to we're going to think his thoughts. We're going to be reminded of who he is. We're going to worship him for what he has done. Right? This kind of intentional, I, I need to be in the house of God. 
so that I can think his ways. It's, it helps us. You might walk in here not realizing that you're, you know, you're taking God for granted, but you don't know it, and then all of a sudden in the midst of corporate worship, it's like God meets with you. Has that ever happened to you? It can happen to you, and it happens, you know, it can happen to you when you're alone in the car. There's been some of the most surprising places where all of a sudden the reality and the, the enormity of God Almighty has like impacted me, and I'm like, I pull, I've had to pull off the side of the road before because, you know, I'm driving under the influence or something because I, I, I can't see, I can't see. I'm just like, God, uh, that's what rest areas were made for. You go to the rest area because God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, has impacted your life in that space and you got to praise him. So don't take him for granted. Because he is unfailing love, he's so easy to take him for granted. You just, he's always there. Have you ever prayed to God and he not pick up the phone, so to speak? Has he not? No, he's always ready to, to love and, and talk with us. We're the ones slow to do that. So you can build your life on him, do that. You can take him for granted, don't do that. And lastly, you know, what does it mean to know a God who is unfailing love, you and I, we can love other people, we can love one another with the same unfailing love of God. God is love. And what he's doing, I believe, in his people, he is for sure recreating us in the very image of Jesus, who is the exact representation of God, God who is love, and what he's doing in us is making us like him, meaning love can move on from just being something that you do. It will always be an action. You know, love is, is an action, active verb, right? But to also simultaneously change us, like love as a noun, like we become like him where we actually are loving because we've so received the love of God and and do you know what this will do? You are able to love people in your family. That crazy aunt, you know, you know what I'm talking about? You can love her with the love of God because you are becoming like Jesus, and he is love. We become love. What's the blessing for the people in your life is that they don't have to wonder what they're going to get from you today. I wonder if I'm going to get cranky Neil today. Is Cranky Neil coming to work or is it Gracious Neil? Right? Is he going to be a little angry or is he going to be loving? You become like God in this. You become like Jesus and people in your life, there's a consistency in your life where they just know what they're going to get. Do you know how great that is for them? And, and what an amazing testimony of the power of God in your life. Because could you become love without him? Not at all. He is a God of unfailing love. He's recreating us into, into the image of Jesus. And increasingly, we can be people who just love because we belong to Christ. Unfailing love, this covenantal unfailing love is such an essential and distinctive quality of God that the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles, throughout the scripture, you see it. Because unfailing love is so unique and essential and distinctive of God that it should also characterize the people of God. And yes, people will take advantage of the church because of the unfailing love of God on display and expressed through us. They will, but we let them. We're wise, but we don't hold grudges. We forgive rebellion, wickedness, and sin because our God is one who forgives rebellion, wickedness, and sin. And we follow him. So we see passages, right? Like, I love Micah 6, 8. Uh, in the Old Testament, right? We see passages like this where the people of God should reflect the God that they know and serve and love. He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. To actually become that kind of person. And then if you... If we go into the New Testament, just continuing on with um, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, John writes, this is how God showed his love among us. So catch this, okay? How did an un unfailing love 
of God, God who's, who is unfailing love, how did he show his love to us? This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, here it is, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. That's why it's such the greatest command, you know, love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, Jesus said, if you love one another. It's his unfailing love lived in and through us. We need to be people who reflect the love of God. We want to respond to this goodness, right? We want to respond today to the love of God. I think about the night that, uh, when Jesus was betrayed uh, in Matthew's account, Matthew 26. He's establishing uh, the Lord's Supper, you know, the, the bread and the cup. And do you remember what he said about the cup? Matthew 26, verse 27. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. God's covenantal love. Jesus said, when you drink this cup, this is the new covenant in my blood. What do you mean? Well, how is God relating to humanity? Who is, you know, escaping the wrath of God and all the, you know, and who is experiencing the mercy and compassion and grace and forgiveness of God? It's those who entrust their lives to Jesus because he's the only one who died shedding his blood to pay the price for our sins. And what's beautiful about this new covenant, what's beautiful about the new covenant found in the blood of Jesus is that when God looks at us with his eyes of compassion and grace, he feels for, and he looks through the blood of Christ and he, he sees no sin. He sees, he sees Jesus when he looks at us because we are in covenant with him. He sees Christ and all the beauty and the perfection of Christ has been given to us because he shed his blood for us. This is his blood. This is the blood of the new covenant. And those in a covenantal relationship with God, his love is unfailing. We want to respond to this great God. We want to give him our hearts. We want to sing his praise. We want to seek him in prayer. We want to remember Jesus who died on the cross because it is the demonstration of God's love for us, right? And eat the bread, drink the cup, and remember what he has done. So let's stand together. Let's join our hearts and our voices as we worship God.